Okay, once again, if you have questions about homework, you know, feel free to contact me. Do you have any questions right now before we start the lecture? Um, <laughs> uh, I have done number four. Um, I'm having a problem number three, but you know, you, you know how to do it. Well, I, I hardly started it. Very attractive because I'm just finishing up. Okay, so I guess my question with number three, um, so like the the derivative of of uh, that function theta mm -hmm. of theta x is zero for uh, negative infinity to zero. Or not including zero, right? Right. And then from yeah, zero to so like how would you I'm not exactly sure how to express where it is at zero, uh, that derivative there. I'm not exactly sure what to do with that. Okay. Um I would focus on I haven't looked at it recently myself, so I would focus on the definition that the integral of delta of x dx is equal to um, is equal to one and so that means that when I have the um, oh and I suppose I should also the integral of minus infinity to infinity f of x delta I can't write. Okay, so those, those are the two things that we had, the, the entire definition of the delta function. And so with that definition, then we can know right away that we are going to satisfy the first rule just by what you articulated already, that the derivative for everything that's less than zero is going to be derivative of a constant zero. Derivative of everything greater than zero is going to be zero. And then we simply have to say, well, what happens at that boundary? Are we going to have an area of one or will a function, um, the integral of a function times delta, that's the integral of a function times the derivative of the Heaviside function, give me my original function at that point. So I believe that's the way to go. That is the integral of right because that that would be putting in the delta x there. So if it's equal to delta, then that should be equal to f of zero and so that's that's what we would want to check then is what do we get when we do this and yeah i'm pretty sure that if i go a step further i'll have solved it so i'm going to stop <laughs> and now i erase everything you can always go and look at it the the youtube but just so you have a nice clean copy of the homework because i looked at you know when i had helped on other homework. I looked at it later. I'm like, well, now it's a now it's a messy homework page. That's not okay. Any other questions? See, so you said okay. Nothing in particular. You said right. Uh, yeah, I mean, number four is just basically like what we did last last class period. They just put the extra. Yeah, you you have the extra ones. You have in this case three solutions instead of two. Two boundaries, we're going to have to apply the two boundary conditions. Okay, then let's get to the lecture. So we're going to look at the finite square well. We already did the infinite well, so I call this the finite square well just to make sure that we're distinguishing between the two. Because I tell you what, when I was taking quantum physics, I was like, didn't we already do this problem? Isn't the same thing? It's very similar. 
But what we have now is we're going to have a potential energy function that instead of being infinite is going to be finite. So we have a potential energy function that I got to open the door. Somebody left his backpack. <clears throat> It's okay. So we're going to make our potential function such that we define it as zero potential energy outside of the well and a negative potential inside the well. So that means if you write your potential energy function, So there is writing out your potential energy function. Three regions. It's zero outside, minus V0 inside, and then zero outside again. So now to tackle this, yeah, I, my next slide tells you how to do it, but I'm just going to go to the side and start working it. If you were going to tackle this without me instructing you, how would you start? Have to do something before the boundary conditions. And by the way, we are going to solve this for energy that's less than zero. An energy that's greater than minus V zero, but less than zero. But before we apply the boundary conditions, we need something to apply it to. Yeah, so like the, the exponentials, so the okay, we need to solve the Schrodinger equation in each of the three regions. So in region one, we've, we've gone through this enough. You might just know the answer. And so I'll ask you if you know the answer. If not, we'll work it out. Do you know what the answer is in region one? Okay. You're you're in the right ballpark, but not correct, so I'm gonna go through and do the work. Okay. So we start with the Schrodinger equation. So I better put I'll just put region one. So we have minus h bar squared over 2m d second dx squared of psi 1. And my potential here is 0. So I'm just going to have plus 0, right? I'm not going to waste time. Equals minus. I put minus because my energy is negative. So my E will be now a, a magnitude, but it's negative. Does that work for you, or do you prefer to do it another way? That's fine. Okay. Um, actually, no, I just, I changed my mind. My E is the true energy, so my E is a negative value. But you do have to remember that, or you'll get yourself messed up. So is equal to E psi 1. Now, the solution to this has the form psi is equal to e to the bx. So now we substitute that in, take the second derivative, and this Schrodinger equation becomes minus h bar squared over 2m b squared psi equals e psi. And so either 
psi has to be zero. Trivial solution that we do not accept as our solution. Or we have to have plus or minus because I'm throwing in a square root. Got to put the minus sign in there. And now is where we have to think it through. This is where the mistake was you guys made. This is a square root of minus 2me over h bar squared. But e is a negative value. Right? The reason I was going to put minus e to make e a positive is so I wouldn't look like I have a square root of a negative. This is going to be a real square root, not an imaginary square root. And so we define... Kappa is the square root of minus 2me over h bar squared. So kappa is a real number, a real positive number. And then I'll have my solution is psi in region 1 is equal to a e to the minus kappa x plus b e to the plus kappa x. I'm almost done. There's one more step that I know you know. This is not a sinusoid, right? right. So it's not a free particle. It's something that I can normalize if I do what? <laughs> I'm not supposed to ask questions that way. What do I have to do to make this normalizable? You have to get rid of the one that goes to infinity. You have to get rid of the one that goes to infinity. Because this is in the region where x is negative. This, by the way, was x equals 0 here. Since this is the region where x is negative, then e to the minus kappa x is going to be e to a positive exponent. And so this one here blows up. So we need this has to be zero. So now what we're left with is psi one is equal to b e to the kappa x. You guys had, were talking about e to the i k x, right? It it had to do with that, with with that. So now we have what our function is. Now we're going to have to match boundary conditions to find what B is. But we have what the function is. Let's jump to region 3. What am I going to have for my solution in region 3? A I think F is what the textbook used. I'm just trying to guess, you know, at this point. Could be F, could be G. But now this one has to have the minus sign, as you appreciated, because we can't have the one that blows up. So we've got those two. Those Once you do one, you've got the other. What about in the middle region? It has to be continuous over boundaries. Yes. Well, shall I go through and do it? Yes, okay. <laughs> so in the middle region, I start with my Schrodinger equation. And I'm going to have minus h bar squared over 2m d second psi 2 dx squared 
plus my potential here is going to be minus V0 in that region. So there I've written out my full Schrodinger equation. is equal to e plus v0. Now let's come back and look at our picture. e is negative, v0 is negative. Um, or no, v0 was a positive value because it goes down to minus v0. So e plus v0 is going to be uh, now I have to think. It's either positive or negative and it's kind of important that we figure this out. It's going to be a positive value. And yeah, V, yeah. Yeah, the e, e plus V zero is going to be this distance. The um, yeah. So v v zero is going up that distance, if you will, and then e brings it down here. Yeah, you're right. It's this. Right. That that's where the signs. <laughs> I have to pay attention to. We we've learned this by now. So this is going to be, I'm going to rewrite it one more time. Like that. And the solution, once again, has to be of the same form. <laughs> Where did I write that down? Yeah, it has to be the same form. And so this is going to be b squared equals and either side 2 is 0, trivial solution that we rule out, or we have to have this and so we define k is equal to that and so this is equal to plus or minus i k this remember with our definition the e plus v zero was positive and so that's the positive thing. And then I still have the square root of the minus sign here, which gave me the IK. So this is where I have the solution with the IKs. And so now I have in region two, That's one way of writing it. Another way of writing it is right. You can write it either way. They're both correct. And what, what was that? I was saying that's what we do with the like oh. either I K to cosine. Yeah. 
So you can write it either one of those ways. And which way you want to write it is going to, you know, depend on what's easier. Honestly, I don't remember which one's easier. I should have worked this out before. If I had worked it out, of course, before today instead of before Sunday, I would have realized that my initial choice of sign saying E is positive would have been the better choice. I think that's the standard choice. But hey, we made a decision. We're sticking with it. So for ease of calculus, see, for E is less than zero. So E is a negative number in what I have right. Well, no, that is, that is the same. It's the same definition. Well, good. So we have those defined and we get, yeah, I, I went, I skipped all the work to leave it to myself. So we have these equations and I'm looking down here to see what I want to do. And I have tangent. If I have tangent, I'm probably going to want to use the sine and cosine. So I'm going to use those just based on where I went with this slide. So now we have to do what you guys said, apply the boundary conditions. So rewriting, I have psi region one is equal to a e to the, no, it was B, wasn't it? Who cares? Okay, I care, it turns out. You have to, yeah, B e to the kappa x is what I wrote. And then psi 2 is equal to C cosine of kx. I called it here L. So I wouldn't get my K and Kappa confused. That was why I chose L. <laughs> um, and then Psi 3 is that. So there's our three solutions. Now we need to match boundary conditions. What are the boundary conditions? So, uh, I assume that's be continuous. Okay. And? Except in the case of an infinite boundary, right? What we did in class on Monday was infinite boundaries. There we saw the difference and why it usually is continuous. So like for problem four, you're using that discont discontinuity in the slope as part of your solution process because it's an infinite boundary. Here it's not infinite, so those are our conditions. How many boundaries do I have? And so let's apply these. So at x equals minus a over 2. Which two wave functions meet at a, x equals minus a over 2? Uh, one, two. Okay, so I'm going to have psi 1 at minus a over 2 equals psi 2 at minus a over 2, which gives me b e to the minus kappa a over 2 equals C cosine of minus K A over two plus D sine minus K A over two. Right, so there's one boundary condition. Um, it's not K over two, it's A over two because my box is going, oh, darn it. The box is going from minus a to plus a. I had written over here minus a over two to plus a over two, making it have a width of a. It has a width of two a according to my picture, and if it has a width of two a according to my picture, by golly, okay. So.
There. That was why. Now it's all straight. So there's one boundary condition. Put the box back around it. So that's the function is continuous. Now I need to have the slope of the function is continuous. So for the slope of the function, and so that's going to give me taking the derivative. I have kappa b e to the minus kappa a equals derivative of cosine is minus sine. And derivative of sine is positive cosine. And so there is a second equation. So that's half of my boundary conditions. Let's go to the second boundary. So at x equals plus a, psi of 2 of a equals psi 3 at a. So there is a third boundary condition. And our final boundary condition doing the derivatives yet again. Got to turn off the shapes. My K turned into a triangle. All right. I have four boundary conditions. Oops. Who wants to solve these babies? Four equations. I forgot a negative. Um, No, oh, not A's, they're X's. I was focusing on what the problem was going to be and wrote A's instead of X's. Okay, do you agree with that? Yeah. Okay, then we just take this and we evaluated A, so I just changed all the X's to A's.
And so it should have a minus sign for the sine term, but a plus sign for the cosine. Minus, plus, and let's check and make sure I was consistent. Minus, plus, yeah. Okay, so we have these four equations, and it doesn't look really super happy fun time. I, I don't know what you think when you look at it, but to me it's like, hmm, it's going to be a little annoying. Now, things I can do. Sine of minus Ka is minus sine of plus Ka. And so that's going to change this side, and that's equal to Kc sine of Ka. Cosine of minus Ka is cosine of plus Ka. It's symmetric. So we look at this, and then if we look at this, not equal to that, right? But it is k times this. So we can make some direct relationships between those two as well as, um, whoops, missed, very close. Okay, what happened to my screen? Come back, there we go. So those are the same thing, except for this is K. So I can combine those two equations and say, kappa B E to the minus kappa A is equal to K times F E to the minus kappa A. Is that correct? I mean, I think it's correct, but I'm looking at you. Oh, wait, no, it's not. Why is it not correct? Because the C's of cosine on the right. Yes, that's right. Left. I was thinking, wow, that's going to be easier than I thought. Okay, so... So we've got ourselves, oh, such a handy set of equations here. I'm trying to think of, I don't even remember what the best way to solve this is. Obviously, this is the solution you get from it. That is, you find a relationship between kappa and k and tangent of ka and getting there is it's just math but it's math i really should have done beforehand so i would know which direction to start with <laughs> because because i've got so many equations to work from I think, well, I don't want to get myself in a confused state here. And so if I start trying to work it out, I will certainly take more than the remaining 15 minutes and probably not get to the end before class ends. So I, I, will, um, I will just go through and do the math and just add it to the notes so you can look at the notes. I'll send you an email when it's done so you can see it worked out. Um, for now, I want to get to what we do to find the quantized levels, right? So what we have to do is we have to find what, what K, B, um, C, B, C, D, F, K, and Kappa are. We have all of those as unknowns. Six unknowns, that's only three equations right there. And as we work our way through, we'll have normalization that will give us, you know, a few more conditions that, that will allow us to solve it. But we're going to find this relationship that I put in the circle between kappa and k. Now, 
I'm going to shift from K to L because at this point, it will be too hard to keep my K separate from my kappa. So we have this equation that says kappa is equal to L tangent of LA, and there is no analytical way to solve that. You cannot solve this to find L as a function of, um, of kappa. It, it, it just doesn't work out. So what we're going to do is we're going to define a variable and just say Z is equal to LA. Or K actually is what I was looking for, not kappa. Um, K, because we want to find the quantized energy levels. So you, you can't solve this for K or for L as the case may be. So we're going to define Z as LA. So we're going to have kappa over L is equal to tangent of LA or equals tangent of Z. And I can now rearrange by defining Z zero. Where does this come from? I kind of like the circles from time to time. Where does that come from? Yes. Going back up to the kappa definition, kappa was minus 2me over h bar squared. And so um, well, yeah, that was e though. So that's, yeah, that's still not right. Um, if we divide, define Z0 and Z as shown, let's put them into this equation to show that it gives us that relationship. That is tangent of LA, doing the substitution, is equal to the square root of Z0, A over H bar, square root 2 MV0, divided by Z, which is going to be um, square root of 2m and then we had times a so that thing squared minus 1. That's what this equation is if you substitute the z0 and the z back in. I'm going to fix that principle. Well, clearly my a's are going to cancel here. So let's cancel those right off the bat. Likewise, the h bar squares are going to cancel. h bar, h bar square in this, under the square root. And the two m's are going to cancel. So this is equal to the square root of and I'm going back up to make sure, yeah, making sure I had the signs the same there for the, the K. So that's what we get with this substitution. Now, is that the same as we get with our original equation? It better be, right, or else we can't make the substitutions and, and move forward. So with our original substitution, we had tangent of LA is equal to kappa over L is equal to the square root of
So that would be just putting kappa over O. And so you cancel and it's clear. Two M's cancel, the over H bar squares cancel. Except for one thing. Why do I have a minus sign in one and not in the other? Okay. I have a sign wrong. Oh, no. This sign here. There we go. <laughs> so they are the same thing. So given that they're the same thing, then we take this and we plot this function and we plot this function. So what we have here is So this y2 function is that line, and the y function one function is, uh, let's not point to the wrong one. The y one function is that. And the, uh, <laughs> the, the last line here is um, between the tangent and the next tangent, you have the the cotangent, the one over tangent. I don't have that written here, but that's another set of solutions. This is one set and that's the other set. And so every place that you have an intersection between the two lines that we graphed is where this equation is true. So this sets up a quantized energy state. You only have certain energies but this is not so simple as what we had before. Before we had N was a simple multiplicative integer if it was the particle in the box. When we had the simple harmonic oscillator, you went up by H bar omega for each value of N. Now our Ns are varying. And so we have discrete energy levels, but they're not following a simple, easy to diagnose pattern. So we can calculate what the energy states are, but you have to do a much more complicated method of doing that. So once you have those energy states and you've worked out the relationships between B, C, D, and F, then you can come back and find your solutions. And one of the things that you'll note here is depending on which solution you have, you have either an anti-symmetric or if you prefer odd function solution or a symmetric solution. So symmetric about the center or anti-symmetric about the center. Same as we had for the particle in the box. but it's not zero outside of the box. There is a certain probability that it can be outside of the box if it's a finite box, even if it doesn't have enough energy to be outside of the box. And so that's going to be, you know, we talked about tunneling oh so briefly. If we have that, um, actually, did we talk about tunneling? Yeah. Yeah. The, um, yeah, yeah, because with the single delta function, in theory, it can only exist in that point for the delta well. But in practice, it could be outside of the well. But it approaches zero as you get farther away. So we have the same thing here. It can be outside of our well, but not very far. When we talk about tunneling next week, hey. Before we have, we'll probably have the test a week from Friday. I haven't looked at the schedule carefully. I know it's scheduled for this Friday, but it's not going to happen this Friday. You're not ready for it. Um, we'll see that if we put another well that's close to this, if we put another well that goes right here,
then the probability of this wave of the particle jumping from here to here is no longer zero. There is a certain probability that it exists in the second well if it's in the first well. And so tunneling is the transfer from one well to the other, even though it doesn't have enough energy to go up and over. So like I said, I will, um, we're only two minutes left in class. I will come back this afternoon and I will just down here at the bottom, I will do the math that connects from the four equations that are in the box to finding the values of B, C, D, and F and getting this um, transcendental equation. And I'll, I'll send you a message when it's available so you can just go to OneNote and see the rest of it. Okay, uh, good. Um, this is going back to the test. Uh, you made a comment about the quality of the Friday. Yeah. But that, that actually is um, our spring break. Oh, really? And uh, remember when I had emailed you, um, I think it was a few weeks ago now, uh, that I would be gone starting that Wednesday. Yeah. So, I, of course, I don't remember the message. I remember that you emailed me. Yeah. And I thank you for giving me plenty of warning. Yeah, I'll be gone starting the 20, I believe it's the 28th um, of February. So it'd be that Wednesday through uh, spring break. Okay. Well, we'll definitely have to make up some lectures somewhere along the way then. Because, yeah. I think I've got more than one lecture before we can, you know, have the test. And okay, well, I will check and see what times this room is available, and then I'll come to you guys on Monday. With these are the times the room is available. Match it against when you are, so we can make up a couple lectures. All right. Have a good long weekend. I'm sorry I won't be here Friday, but remember I won't be here.